talking about interdisciplinary approaches to the study of learning using technology-rich learning environments. Uh, since it is a summer school, I think what I tried to do is sort of think about the kinds of research questions you might be asking when you're studying cognition and reasoning and affect together. And so um, some of my questions are, what should teaching and learning look like in the 21st century? What leads to successful learning? How can advanced technologies foster learning, teaching, and assessment? And through that, I'll talk about this initiative called the Learning Environments Across Disciplines Project that sort of gives an overview of how we've been addressing answers to these questions. And I'll give you some examples and lessons learned. Basically, um, my mantra is it's time for change. Education really hasn't changed. It looks the same way it does today as it did 100 years ago, unfortunately. And even though we keep saying we need to introduce technology in the classrooms, it seems like we, are, we may have laptops in front of us, but we're not necessarily using it in an embedded or integrated way. So how do we engage students, since our students who come to class are already digital natives, in educational opportunities? And a lot of these variables on, on the right-hand side um, are things that make technology, gaming, you know, advanced simulations fun. And why it's fun is because you can personalize education through technology. You can enhance student interest by having opportunities that capitalize on their interests, give them opportunities that they'll value, provide sensory stimuli, and adaptive challenges that are at their level of learning rather than too hard or too easy give them some uh, sense of control over their learning rather than just tell them what to do and help them learn through interaction by uh, giving them ongoing feedback that helps them advance in their, along the trajectory of learning. And part of what's fun about technology, if it's designed correctly for education, is the idea of uncertainty and suspense. You want to know what's going to happen next and these are opportunities that you can des design into your environments. So the leads Partnership grant is funded by SHRC, and you know, I'm very happy about this grant. It's a seven-year grant, and, and in Canada, that's, that's unusual to have these big grants. And there are 18 universities involved uh, from five countries. We have 12 partners and five advisory partnerships, uh, partner advisory board members. Um, we're halfway through um, our grant. And it's interdisciplinary. We have educators, psychologists, computer scientists, historians, physicians, um, and uh, engineers who all specialize in various things and brought together um, are creating interesting learning environments using technology. And the expertise that they bring are experts in cognition, affect, and assessment, computational modeling, natural language, uh, machine learning, et cetera. And uh, I'll give you a few examples of that. But the main goal of LEADS is that we have three intersecting uh, themes. Learning, assessment, and emotion we feel go hand in hand. And we have three theme leaders that help organize this initiative. Roger Azevedo is the theme leader for learning. We have Reinhard Peckrin, who's the theme, theme leader on emotion, and Jackie Layton on assessment. And together, all of our projects are looking at these three things um, using um, and, as an integrated way of designing new environments for learning. So we want to look at what factors lead to better learning across age levels and in different disciplines. As Julian said, we're looking at subject matter expertise and various things. And we're looking at learning from elementary to post-secondary school. And we're trying to find ways of engaging students in positive emotions rather than negative emotions. Obviously, we know that negative emotions lead to burnout and to uh, dropout. And uh, we're designing what Val Shute calls stealth assessments in, in terms of how do you embed assessment in the learning environment so people are being tested but they're not feeling like they're being tested because part of the assessment is just the challenge of learning. So some of the technology rich environments are all sorts of different kinds. We have intelligent tutoring systems. We have um, multi-agent environments, which Roger will talk about. We have augmented virtual environments with mobile technologies. We have high and low fidelity simulations in medicine, and we have um, virtual reality games. And um, so what we're trying to do is really look at different types of environments in different, in different ways and see how they can be used to promote learning. So what are the skills that we're trying to look at? Obviously, cognition is an important thing, critical thinking, decision making, problem solving. Um, anybody that writes a grant now is talking about lifelong learning and flexibility in 21st century skills. 
Things that we don't talk about as much but need to with technology are the social skills and collaboration, team effectiveness, multiple perspective taking, how do you assess that using technology or in technology rich contexts? Metacognition, self-regulated learning, how do we promote that in the context of learning so that people can eventually become self-regulated learners and will not need to depend on others as much? Affect and emotion regulation, um, how can we help students learn how to control their own emotions as well as um, respond to others' emotions in a way that's socially acceptable? Um, and motivational components such as persistence um, uh, in, and resilience uh, are things that we're interested in. So the frameworks, and most of you have already studied all of these things, I'm sure, but our major frameworks are looking at learning through frameworks of expertise. How do people become more proficient? How do we identify what differentiates novices from experts along a continuum? Part of identifying expertise in particular subject matter expert, uh, uh, domains helps you decide when and where to provide scaffolding so that pe people can become more um, proficient at specific things. And also when um, and how do we help people self-regulate their learning, we need to find the cognitive components that they should be attended to and then help them plan and monitor and evaluate how well they're doing on such cognitive components. And cognitive apprenticeship as a framework to make um, environments more authentic so people are situated in a context that's meaningful to them and, and students can see a shelf life beyond the class that they're in. And finally, the mind-body-spirit connection, otherwise known as how do we look at the relationship between affect and cognition, has been um, something that's as old as 1890 where William James was talking about these things going hand in hand. Um, but we're looking at constructs such as caring, empathy, emotional regulation, interest, persistence, et cetera, boredom, and uh, trying to see how to um, assist people in the more positive uh, affect framework. So some of the digital footprints we'd like to say that, that students leave in the context of uh, technology is that there are multiple ways of looking at learning and affect, um, and some of the ways that we're looking at uh, Emotion are through face reading technologies. What does your face tell you? Um, how many people are actually leaning in and leaning out right now? Is your posture in a good way? I hope. <laughs> so if you're leaning in, that's good. If you're leaning back, you're bored. Um, what do your eyes say in terms of eye tracking? Where are you looking on the screen? Are you basically all over the place? Are you attending to where you should be? Um, physiological responses. How much are you sweating? And it's not just because you've had your coffee today and uh, what self-report tells you in terms of uh, motivation, et cetera. So what are these digital footprints? Um, as I said, we, can, we collect log file analyses that um, look at learning analytics. We look at think aloud verbal protocol data to, and we code them according to the um, things that we're interested in, whether it's metacognition or co-regulation, socially shared regulation, et cetera. Electrodermal activation, facial expressions, posture, eye tracking, self-report, and brain imaging. So I'll give you a few examples from LEADS, um, from history, physics, science, and medicine. Um, Val Shute has been studying uh, learning environments in physics, and when most of you think about uh, laws of motion, you, you're, it, you remember that gravity and motion are, you learn through these declarative factual things that well, what happens when you're on a ramp? There's a change in direction of the motion. What, what do you do with levers? What do you do with pendulums? What do you do with springboards? And, and how does this affect gravity and motion? These are all very interesting things that you can use in equations. But unless you use it in a context of learning, it's sort of like, why am I even thinking about a ramp, a lever, a pendulum, and a springboard? Well, what Val Schutt's been doing is designing Newton's playground, where kids actually design their own objects, make them come to life, um, using um, laws of physics and motion. And players create these physical objects and then test to see whether their theories about physics and gravity and motion actually work. And so they d design these little pictures and they make them come to life and the objects, as you can see, this is like a long lever on this um, uh, dinosaur tail and the longer it gets and the more pressure you put on it will make this balloon go higher. Uh, the goal is to get the balloon up here, so how do you make these objects come to life following the three laws of motion? So if you look at this little video, okay, so they're testing this hypothesis. They have to put some force on it. Oh, not enough force. Let's put a little bit more force. 
Well, it's getting higher, but it's still not getting to where it's supposed to go. So they basically are experimenting with their hypotheses and through, through these inquiries eventually um, get the right answer. They have a little refraction going on here and boom, they will get the answer. What's neat about this, you know, and Val calls this awesomeness, is that kids are creative in the pictures and the ways in which they test their hypotheses. So how, how does she test this is through, she has this wonderful underlying cognitive map on the left that you can't read, um, but basically it's full of 21st century skills that she's um, collecting competency data on how proficient they are at the aspects of physics um, and persistence and understanding and creativity. So it's a very interesting way of testing what students understand about physics. So what about history? Like most people learn about history, they, they read a bunch of facts and then they have multiple choice tests, um, which everybody loves and actually learning about history in Quebec right now is sort of controversial. Um, I'll leave you to, for a dinner conversation about that. But so what we've been looking at with um, Kevin Key and Eric Quatra is looking at learning outside it, as the city becomes your museum for learning. And so they've designed augmented reality mobile applications where you can learn um, about history by doing walking tours. So if you're in front of the Brock Monument and you say, well, it's just another monument, well, why would I even be interested in what, it, what, what, it is, uh, what this monument's about? Well, what can make it interesting is that you can actually learn uh, why this monument is here and what was interesting about, um, uh, uh, you know, the person, the, about Brock and, and that there was actually um, an investigation for who killed him and why there was a bombing of the Brock Monument in 1840. And it becomes an inquiry uh, about history rather than let's just take a walking tour. And so what we've been looking at even at McGill is sort of using convergent methodologies for um, McGill today and McGill yesterday and sort of seeing what students are learning on their walking tours of McGill. Are they learning to his, uh, about history? Can you test the learning that using these mobile apps? And part of the ways that we're testing them are using eye tracking and uh, electrodermal response data to see are they excited about learning this way and do they learn more than in other ways? And it just makes learning a little bit more fun. And uh, so what we're doing is sort of looking at the difference between lab learning and virtual reality and then going outdoors and seeing how you can test various things in these ways. So in medical apprenticeships, um, you know, most of learning even today goes on by the bedside in medicine. And we've been looking at different ways of fostering learning and assessment in medicine using technology. And in medicine, they often call um, you know, technology advanced learning as a simulation. You think of a simulation, and Tondi Young will talk, I'm sure, a little bit about this later. Something that is made to look, feel, or behave like something else, especially so that it can be studied or used to train people. Since they feel real, they are valued. So a simulation, if it feels real, then you feel like you're actually doing something real, and you learn best by doing and interacting with the simulation. So what we try and look at is ways of providing deliberate practice opportunities with dynamic assessment to increase learning through individualized feedback. So there are different kinds of simulations. You have technical <coughs> skills training, you have serious games, you have augmented smartphone applications, you have simulation animations of how a system works, simulation modeling to see cause and effect, team-based simulations with high fidelity mannequins or role plays with simulated human patients, and you have one-on-one -on -one intelligent tutoring systems and finally virtual reality immersive environments. So what I'd like to talk about are some of these um, simulations and advanced technologies in various um, medical uh, domains. So one of the things we're interested in is diagnostic reasoning. And the questions we ask are, do students become more accurate and more expert-like in the processes that they take during clinical reasoning? In teamwork, we have simulations with mannequins and we say, how do effective teams differ from less effective teams? In technical skills training with mannequins, what do our eye movements reveal? Um, do the eye movements reveal the most common areas of interest attended to during surgery? Are these the correct areas of interest that people should be attending to? In patient communication, we're, un we're trying to develop technologies to help students um, communicate bad news more appropriately to their patients. Do students identify, respond to patients' coping strategies effectively? 
um, using standardized patients, and do differences in emotions emerge across different training environments, be it real or simulated? So in all of these um, contexts, scaffolding is at the heart of how we promote learning. So what are the kinds of scaffolds that are important? We're interested in cognitive scaffolding, metacognitive scaffolding, motivational scaffolding, and uh, emotional scaffolding. So I'll give you briefly a few um, examples. Critical thinking and problem solving using BioWorld, which is a deliberate practice environment for clinical reasoning. Communication, empathy, and perspective taking using Howard, an environment to support online small group facilitation uh, for learning how to communicate bad news. Collaboration uh, in team effectiveness, which we've been looking at um, medical military trauma teams and persistence and effort um, in the face of diversity uh, through the deteriorating patient application, which is basically helping um, patient, uh, medical students manage emergencies. And emotional regulation in uh, surgical uh, skills training. So BioWorld looks like this. Many of you have seen it before. It actually looks a lot different than this at this moment. It's being rebuilt. But what's interesting about it is it does provide a cognitive apprenticeship to help students learn and uh, deliberately practice their clinical reasoning uh, skills and we assess their competence hand in hand with learning. We encourage metacognition by trigger triggering students to externalize, monitor and evaluate their evidence through evidence palettes. And we scaffold learners with different types of feed feedback based on models of expertise. Again, some of the questions that we've been asking, do students become more expert, more expert-like in the processes, not just in whether they get better at diagnoses? And is there a relationship between help-seeking and improvement? And what role does emotion play once feedback is received? Do high performers have higher self-regulated learning? And what emotions do students experience during and after patient cases? What emotions are experienced in response to feedback that they get that's correct or incorrect? So we use multi-channel data collection. As I said, we have eye tracking, we have think alouds, we have the electrodermal bracelets, and we have face reading technology, and all of these things are used to tell a story. Um, this student at the end of uh, BioWorld is looking at the feedback that she receives in comparison to an expert trace, and I just want you to sort of look at her reaction, because that will tell you a little bit. So the act of surprise and the laughing about the fact that she's actually wrong is an emotion. And it's like shock that she's wrong. And a lot of medical students are shocked because they're so overconfident. <laughs> and that, so what does she do, though, with that? You know, some people would become angry because they're wrong. This person actually dials down. She says, OK, I'm wrong. OK, well, let's look. And she attends very carefully to the feedback. So your reaction to feedback has a, um, you know, your emotions to feedback and your reactions to feedback have a lot to do with motivation uh, attributions that you start with. Whether you're mastery oriented, whether you're performance goal oriented, has an influence. So mastery goal oriented students will take this well. This student's actually mastery oriented. Whereas one that is performance oriented that wants to look better than everyone else and compete is not so happy and basically gets ticked off and doesn't look at the feedback. So these are lessons learned, especially, you know, this is medicine and they're all trying to be high achievers. But imagine if you're, you know, in high school, which is even more complex, you might just get people that are completely bored and angry and never re-engage. So the, the relationship between emotion and uh, motivation and cognition is important. So all to say that all of these data sources are important, tell us different parts of the story. And uh, we use it to ask different questions and answer different questions. So um, we know that students through this um, experience learn to solve more cases, become more expert-like. The help-seeking is an interesting issue. Um, a lot of people don't ask for help, but the help-seeking uh, usually occurs when they get a lab test result that is not what, what it was expected. So again, that shows them that they were on the wrong track, and so then they have to get some more help. Curiosity and positive emotions are, are um, uh, the most prevalent. 
but anxiety or confusion is experienced when lab tests are contradictory to their diagnoses. Performance versus mastery-oriented students experience different emotions when they receive feedback. All right, so moving on to Howard. Um, we've been trying to help students learn how to communicate bad news um, to their patients. This is a quick example. Okay, so just an example of the patient's reaction, the physician's reaction. Um, what we found with students when we're trying to help them learn how to communicate bad news to patients is that sometimes students just come in and they're just interested in getting the diagnosis right and telling the patient everything they need to know about HIV or everything they need to know about the disease when in fact you just told the person they might be dying. You know, and that's all they want to care about is you know, how am I going to be treated. So, we, we try and, using technology, get people to talk about how, what are the components of giving bad news, how do you regulate the patient's emotions and your own emotions, and, and there is a cognitive underlying algorithm that medical students use, should be using, based on um, uh, the medical literature on how to communicate bad news, and so that's called the spikes algorithm on the right. What we've done is set up um, practice environments where students give bad news to standardized patients and then they come together in a, what's called a problem-based learning environment with a tutor and they get vignettes and they talk about how, to, how this physician did it right or how they could have done it better and then they get another opportunity to practice their giving bad news individually. We found that this is sort of like using Adobe Connect. It's a way to have a face-to-face -face environment internationally with students in Hong Kong, and it worked really well. People got better at communicating bad news, but it's not something that's sustainable. You know, so if you're trying to do this, um, it's a lot of manpower to have a problem-based learning environment synchronously um, with four people and, you know, in Hong Kong. So it's not the best use of technology, though it was a lot of fun. So what we're now trying to think of is how do you do this asynchronously? How do you scale up the use of technology and still sort of have you know, some kind of a feel for multiple perspective taking and ways to interact and still learn through the experience? So um, even though uh, we know that these things are helpful in helping students regulate their own emotions and identify patient coping, we're now trying to build this up uh, with Howard, which is a platform that's designed to help a facilitator monitor more than one group and support multiple groups with feedback and uh, help the learners actually see other learning cycles. So the student platform provides a structured whiteboard to help team members annotate um, you know, text. They, they contribute to the discussion using text and they also um, annotate video case scenarios so that they can talk to each other about these cases and they can kind of, it's like Google Doc where you can keep adding and revising your comments. This is a way to add and revise your comments using video. The instructor dashboard is a condensed version of the activities in different groups and we're trying to come up with appropriate metrics to show um, what's happening in each individual group. One group member might be sort of just predominant and everyone else is lurking, some are actually equally sharing and some are just doing their own thing and not even on task. So we're trying to find ways to uh, develop tools that will help in that regard. So the whiteboard looks like this. On the left you've got your vignettes that are video-based exemplars where you get introductions and you have problem presentations. And then they come together through the whiteboard and talk about the variables of problem-based learning, learning objectives according to um, how to give bad news. This is a vignette of a physician giving bad news to a patient and the student's annotations, even though it's bad news that eventually causes illness, I think it's important she, re she be direct about it and framing it as possibly as possible while being realistic. That's one student's annotation. So you have a bunch of students sharing their understanding this way. And the dashboard at the moment looks something like this where you can see differences between group participants in terms of predominant discourse, whether they've completed the tasks that they had to do um, and things like that. I know you really can't read it. The amount of instructor interaction um, and uh, instructor focus on particular groups are also things that we're interested in. 
So moving to team effectiveness, we've looked at trauma teams in the um, simulation center working together and what makes a good, um, good team or a bad team over time. And the way we study this is a period of a week where teams come together and learn how to, how to work um, together for the first time because they've never worked together and trying to see whether they trust each other in the roles that they play for, for trauma simulations. And what we found is that um, some teams are better than others, and, and uh, why is that? Um, again, something that you're not really going to be able to read here, but what you can see is the difference between the left side and the right side. It, whoops, is the, uh, is the amount of connections between people over time. So you see at the top, simulation one, two, and three, okay, my machine's not working, um, is that the high-performing teams on the right-hand side are more firmly threaded, and there's more dialogue between them. Ones on the left, there's, there's very loose connections between groups. And what they're loose about and what they're good about and the high-performing teams are demonstrating more leadership. On the left-hand side, there's no connection between the leadership and the other roles in the team members. So what happens is if the team... Uh, it usually falls apart if the leader's not leading and the other team members have to take over, which is obviously not a good thing, um, because the, the roles then become amb ambiguous and people are, don't trust. And so if you go back to, um, you know, Solace's model of mutual trust, you have to trust each other to be a good team, that everybody in the team will do their job. And situation awareness, are you all aware as team members of um, what your role is and what you should do and when? And, and that, again, is highly um, connected in the right-hand side for high-performing. And then explicit communication versus implicit communication. Um, explicit communication is needed at certain points, and implicit communication usually develops over time when everybody understands their roles. So moving now to another application, which is the de Deteriorating Patient app. Um, this has been developed by Jeff Wiseman and Blanchard, who have been looking at um, how medical students learn how to manage emergencies. And again, there's a cognitive underlying algorithm for how to handle a medical emergency. And that has a lot to do with what uh, Jeff calls the ABCs of medicine, which is managing your airway, breathing, circulation, drugs, endocrinology, blah, blah, blah. That students sort of cycle through what they should be checking when somebody comes in an emergency situation, that these have to be managed before a disease can be managed. Um, so even though you have to take a history and a physical exam and do labs and all of these things, do students know what they should be doing when? So, you know, that they have to actually interact at different points in the cycle. And so what the app is doing is sort of giving different scenarios where people um, are being tutored uh, in the context of these emergencies. And what Jeff Wiseman's interested in is uh, looking at the relationship between cognition and affect in those um, mobile applications. So again, he started doing this as a face-to-face -face role play, which is the cheapest way to do a simulation. <laughs> but again, it takes a lot of time because it's the tutor that's tutoring, and uh, you're doing this face-to-face -face over time, you know, a hundred times with only seven people in a group. So then he started tutoring tutors to t tutor more groups, and we've been developing what's called an ARAD course for emergency response medicine. And then you have seven tutors with 90 students all in different rooms tutoring, which is great too, but it's still, how do you standardize it? And so what he's been doing is we've been analyzing the text uh, from these discourse of, of the small group learning so that we can now de decide how to scaffold these individuals in the context of the mobile app. So how do students learn? Um, using the ABC algorithm and how to handle emergencies, and do stu students learn how to manage their stress in emergency situations? Essentially, if they fall apart there and don't know when to ask for help, the patient dies, which is not a good thing. So, finally, I'll talk a little bit about emotions in surgery, and uh, one of my students, Melissa Duffy, has, she'll be defending next week, uh, has been looking at uh, comparing emotional states in the in the actual OR and in in situ simulations and using uh, affective bracelets in the OR and eye tracking in the OR as well as in situ simulations and looking at the relationships between emotion, attention, and learning. And uh, so in the real OR on the up, upper case and then in the simulated OR on the bottom, the mannequins look pretty real. 
Uh, and she, again, has been using these three different ways of tracking and uh, has been looking at expert novice differences across um, these simulations in terms of the emotions people experience before, during, and after. And um, interesting enough, one of the, the expert novice differences, experts start with a lot of pride, um, but don't necessarily end with a lot of pride. I thought that was an interesting finding because maybe they were, again, uh, as most medical students or physicians are pretty overly confident. So, do, are there differences in emotion across these different training environments? Yes. The real case, obviously, as you'd expect, is more intense in terms of the emotions experienced. But simulations do have the same effect of uh, increasing emotions, and so it's a good venue to practice um, your uh, technical skills. And um, as I said, there are different emotions and levels of expertise in terms of attentional processes. We're now looking at the areas of interest in terms of metrics for analyzing whether there's a trajectory that you can be better training where to look during an operation and uh, what these um, most common areas of interest are. So like that. So what are the lessons learned? I think that technology-rich environments support different types of thinking, and uh, uh, you can provide practice opportunities, you can help make decisions using technology based on the data that you're collecting, and you can determine what works and what doesn't work for specific learners and specific instructional contexts. So I've given you a very broad uh, example, but in essence, we're looking at improving cognition, and, and uh, these environments have helped determine that you can have better accuracy in problem solving and decision making contexts and that metacognition, uh, metacognitive skills can be developed through these environments to help people plan and monitor and evaluate their learning and that positive affect and emotional regulation can be enhanced using these um, uh, enriched environments and that we can study and uh, ultimately improve communication and social skills using these um, techniques. So theory-driven designs can lead to better student engagement, um, deliberate practice, and stealth assessments of learning. And examples of technologies to support cognitive, metacognitive, and affective components of clinical reasoning, communication, and performance have been provided. And converging methodologies described um, provide multiple forms of evidence to determine cognitive, affective, and metacognitive components of learning and data-driven deci decisions about what works and what does not for specific learners and in specific contexts have been made. And we're able to predict student emotions might be, uh, better predict student emotions and um, where there's a need for emotion regulation scaffolding. And finally, with the Howard, trying to look at a way to also change the instructor roles from transmitter to facilitator. So where I think we're changing a little bit, you know, in 2001, Pellegrino um, talked about learning assessment and curriculum being a triad, and that you really, um, you know, we, I still think it's sem a seminal article where we talk about the cognitive competencies drive the curriculum. If you understand how experts and novices differ in particular fields of study, and how you can determine the dif and differentiate um, these models within uh, specific disciplines, um, then you can actually improve instruction by developing these instructional models based on what we know about how people learn. And that you can assess them then against these cognitive competencies in a, in a more robust way. Well, I think what things have, have changed since then is that now we're introducing more how does affect you know, get interlinked with um, these learning components? It's not just about developing cognitive proficiency, but that there is this role that affect plays. And also I think technology environments can really provide that um, platform, if you want to put it that way, that you know, as a way to test your and develop experiments that can test uh, what works and what doesn't, and when it works and when it doesn't, and how to basically keep redesigning until something is more effective. So interdisciplinary research passports, I think, is what's needed in future, where we all work together, that multiple forms of expertise forces us to speak multiple disciplinary languages, which lead to innovative opportunities. It allows researchers to collect and analyze data in, in way, ways that we could not do independently. Like by having these teams, you know, it's really helped us do different things. It leads to new research questions um, that could not be addressed alone. 
And one of the things that we've been able to do with our research partners is that they bring in solutions that we haven't thought about. So one of our partners is CRIM. For you in Quebec, you probably know CRIM in Montreal. And they've been looking at uh, a software platform to help with transcription of video and audio data, automatic transcription that can help us more with coding um, and ha having a coding platform where we can share and annotate um, specific codes uh, that are really helpful. As you know, it takes a long time to transcribe this data. It also provides exposure and synergy to broader research audiences. So I think that uh, from my perspective, it's been a successful project. And, and this is my team here for the leads, and I thank you for your attention. Thank you.